post-traumatic stress is a very debilitating disease, not only to the warrior, but to the family. My friend Nikki, she's awesome. Um, her brother Kyle, he served with my son Dusty, and a young man, I, I remember meeting him when he left on the first deployment, very young man. And um, he served two wars in, in Iraq, uh, two tours in Iraq, I'm sorry. And then when he came home, he lost his battle to post-traumatic stress. Nikki is a post-traumatic stress disorder survivor. She's helping me with this presentation. But um, basically, my goal is, for me and my family, is um, to expand the knowledge on post-traumatic stress disorder and for everybody to realize what a true reality it is. Um, it's, it, it starts on the family the moment that the soldier, sailor, marine, airman leaves home. It truly does. Um, as a mom and a dad, we felt it. I wasn't going to do this and I won't. Uh, we felt it from the moment he left. We knew our son had made the bravest decision that anyone could make. He was stepping in our stead, going in our stead and fighting enemies that we had no idea even as a nation until September the 11th we didn't realize the intensity of it and he, he chose to go. He wasn't drafted. That stopped a long time ago. He, he wasn't drafted. He chose to go and he went and in fact um, during his deployment you know, like I said, it starts when I went through basic training, all of the drama, and if you stop by my booth, I can share some stories with you, some, some real cute and some not so cute, from dealing with the drama. But um, he went to basic training, and then he, um, he took his first tour in Iraq. Well, the first tour was on a ship, the Kearsarge. And I was like, okay, maybe that's not so bad. He's on a ship. He's protected. Everything should be okay until that ship went under fire on the shores of Jordan. And then I knew that any time that there, you're facing an enemy that has a purpose, their purpose is to eliminate them. Okay, so we get through the first deployment, we go on to the second. And we get the phone call and it's Christmas Day and we had just opened gifts and we were, we were missing him terribly. I remember sending him an email the night before telling him how bad it was and how much I missed him. And then we got the call. Well, when they removed us, we had to wait four days. Can you imagine? Four days. I couldn't see my son for four days. And I had no idea. The only thing I knew is that he was going from hospital, from country, from hospital to country, and coming back to us. And then, when I finally got to see him, we, uh, the military, I don't want to take anything away from them and what they did for us, they flew me and my husband and my daughter-in-law to Dusty's side immediately, and um, uh, four days later. But we get there, and we were in a bubble. You know, we were there in the hospital, and they had all of these people willing to do everything they could to make us feel better about this tragedy. And the lady comes in, and she was like, um, the counselor, several days into it, actually it was like one long, long 72-hour day, I think, but several days into it, she comes in and she said, I think that your son has post-traumatic stress disorder. And I was like, what? No, you kid, you don't understand. My baby was shot in the face. Of course he's a little moody. You're supposed to be. And no, he does not. Immediate denial from me. Because why? Was it embarrassing? No, it, I just couldn't let them label him. And I absolutely would not. Well, that was my first mistake. If I had accepted the counseling in the hospital, then I could have learned about it. And I would have known the signs. And I would have known that the withdrawal was not normal. And I would have known that the not sleeping for days on end is not normal. And I would have known that chopping down trees and burning them in the middle of the summer to your face is so red you, you're afraid you're having a stroke is not normal. But my son was still normal. It was just the effects of this post-traumatic stress disorder, right? Well, when it finally hit me, and I mean it hit me 
almost at the speed of a truck running into a tree at 97 miles an hour by choice um, to take one's life. That's how fast. That's what happened to my son last March. And at the moment, um, a year later, I, I can very gladly say that we're healing from it. But my point is, and my mission in this whole project and in this endeavor, I know you guys can tell I'm not a public speaker. I'm a mother. A mother with a mission. A mission to find help for our kids that are going over and fighting in these wars and coming home and the families don't know how to help them. I, um, I got on the internet and I researched and I did as much as I could to find help for my family. To find out a way, something that his brother or sister could do, or me or my husband could do, or friends. I mean, we have so many friends, and I know you've seen the guys running around in these shirts. Those are all friends and family that want to support him and want to help him. But we had no idea where to go or what to do. And um, because we weren't his dependents, we weren't entitled to federal benefits, right? But we were there every single day watching the deterioration of one of our great heroes and um, so when I signed up for the summit I started researching and I found four terrific organizations and I had yes I had called them before but when I called them I was just desperate I was just a desperate person and I know that you guys cannot tell that I have a tendency to ramble right well in a desperate situation that gets worse so I would not even get to my point and they missed the whole object of it Basically, what I'm trying to tell you is I didn't understand post-traumatic stress. I didn't understand what was going on, and I certainly didn't know how to ask for help. Well, preparing for this and looking for places that would help families, I found four wonderful, wonderful organizations, and I want to tell you a little bit about them. There is a place called the, um, Give an Hour, and Give an Hour is psychiatrists and psychologists, licensed professionals that give an hour of their time to the families of wounded warriors and the wounded warriors themselves if necessary. They give you an hour of their time, they donate an hour of their time every single month to help these families rebuild and to help these warriors reintegrate into society. It's an awesome thing. Let's give give an hour a hand. The second group um, is called the Camaraderie Foundation. The way I found out about the Camaraderie Foundation is um, actually from the Wounded Warrior Project, another group that I'm about to tell you about. But the Camaraderie Foundation is um, it's a foundation of professionals, psychological, psychiatry, um, counseling, family counseling, any kind of mental healing professionals that um, already have established offices and the Camaraderie Foundation uses their donations to supply scholarships to families. Now in this I will tell you that my family has received a scholarship for a year of counseling which is phenomenal. Um, I'm not going to use it until after this presentation because I want to be able to focus on it. But they, um, they're a wonderful organization and if, if you need more information about them I have all the information at my table. The third organization is called the Armed Forces Foundation. Um, the Armed Forces Foundation, my first contact with them was actually at the hospital. In the beginning, when it first happened, you can imagine the people that were everywhere when I was in that bubble. They were everywhere, coming to the house, every TV station, every, every person you can imagine was filming it. But then when all of that went away, it was us left there a family trying to understand the physical the physical limitations. Um, I think the first realization of it was when the insurer was brought to the house and did a big stack of insurer because my son was a growing boy. He couldn't just take a can or two. He had to have cases, cases of insurer. And um, I think the physical things just overwhelmed us so much in the beginning that we didn't notice the the emotional strain. But um, the Armed Forces Foundation came to the hospital when we were there. They were one of the ones that were in our bubble with us. And when they got there, they provided a meal for all the families that were there. And then they had these bracelets. And I took a bracelet and I wore it. And um, 
several months after I got home and Dusty was facing another surgery, I called them. And do you know they provided for my family to be able to be there with my son at that surgery. So I'm very grateful for them. And right now they're starting the Save Our Troops campaign. Because does anybody know that we lose a veteran to suicide every 80 minutes, every single day? Um, every 80 minutes. That's a, a startling number for me. When I started this, I was like, oh, no. That seems like a lot. It's unacceptable. So I think, I think as a nation, we're obligated to make this a little easier for them. And the only way we can truly do that is by educating ourselves so that we know exactly what they need. And then if we learn, then all we have to ask them, you know, are we willing? They fought the fight for us. So I think we need to fight the fight for them now. And the fourth organization is here with me, the Wounded Warrior Project. The Wounded Warrior Project, of course, everybody, that's a name that everybody recognizes. And I'm not surprised because they provide so many outlets. They, um, they approach it from every single angle. They do the emotional support for the family members. They do the physical, you know, you know our soldiers, sailors, and Marines and Corps, how all of them need that physical exertion. Even if they're hurt, they just don't want to stop. They've been swimming in the Georgia Aquarium. But the one event that my, my family and I, me and Dusty and Brandy and the girls participated in is bowling. It was a wonderful night. If you can imagine six years of total stress um, involved in both of us learning how to live together, that night was a, a real blessing. We went back. Um, we didn't go with them, but that following Saturday we planned an event for the whole family and went bowling. And if I have my way about it, we'll go all the time until I get a strike at least, because I haven't got a strike yet. Um, and then they also offer trips and all kinds of training. I mean, there's so many things that you can get from the Wounded Warrior Project. So, what I want you to do is come by our table and let me know what you would like to do to help our veterans learn to live and be happy again. And I'm going to save you some time for some questions. <laughs> Go right ahead.